and we'll be moving to a different area now again a very important area that's mental health and uh, dr mahesh rajasurya senior lecturer in psychiatry from the faculty of medicine university of colombo will be talking to us about the stress and ncds thank you uh Chas, uh, and thank you for having me uh, on these foundation foundation sessions uh, with a record uh, participation, uh, uh, 235 right now when I check uh, the participants tab. Um, so it's great. Um, uh, congratulations to Selim. Um, I would. Uh, I'm the last speaker, so I don't think I will have time to uh, look at the questions and type answers in. So I will try to save some time. Uh, from my 30 minutes, and uh, hopefully uh, you can ask questions at the end uh, by unmuting your minds. So I'm going to talk about stress and incidents. Uh, the overview of what I'm going to talk about is this, uh, what is stress, what are NCDs, and how stress um, causes NCDs, and how NCDs cause stress. So let's start off with the question, what is stress? Um, it has a peculiar definition. The concept is a bit um, odd because the, um, the, the, the defining words themselves contain the word stress or, or words related to stress. Right, now there's a stressor. That it is something that causes stress. Right? Stress is something that causes stress. So that's what I meant by, you know, the word stress is there in the definition itself. Stress is something that causes stress. And we, the body, the psychology, our brain, our mind, um, or as a family, as a community, we respond to that stress off, um, which is, uh, you know, uh, it is our reaction to stress off. It may be a physiological reaction, it may be a psychological reaction, it may be a social reaction. Um, so when this, this stressor and this reaction take them together is known as stress. So it's not only what happens to you that determines your level of stress. It's also what you do in response, uh, to the stress. So both are included in, uh, this concept of stress. So let's take a look at, um, some of the stressors and some of the reactions. For an example, something very physical like infection, like an infection, um, you go down with a viral flu or uh, dengue or, or it's uh, cellulitis or, you know, whatever infection, it may be a uh, uh, accident, you know, physical injury, uh, that's a stressor. It could be something like loneliness. It could be a financial difficulty. It might be the threat of quarantine, which is a very prevalent stressor these days and people i don't know whether they are trying to hide uh, symptoms and certain um, important information uh, because of the of quarantine and boredom uh, is also a very uh, uh, serious stressor and many more uh, if you look at some of the reactions um, for an example if you have an infection obviously there will be an inflammation from your body um, or for other, uh, not necessarily all these uh, stressors and reactions are matching. Um, some people, or we sometimes get angry because of some stressor. We get, uh, we sometimes shut down and stop interacting or reduce our interactions with other people or loved ones or the community when we are uh, in stress um, as a reaction. We might stop taking medications. We, we get so angry or we get so dejected or we will, it's kind of taking revenge from the doctor or from the loved ones who stop taking medication. You, sometimes you harm yourself, you take substances that harm yourself, and there can be, I'm just uh, trying to give you an idea what is meant by uh, reactions. Right, next question is what are NCDs? So these are uh, chronic uh, conditions that do not result from an uh, acute infectious process, uh, and it's a disease that has a prolonged course that does not result spontaneously and for which a complete theory is rarely achieved. 
The characteristics of LCDs are, you know, they're complex in etiology. They have multiple risk factors, long latency period. They just don't happen overnight. Non-contagious origin, prolonged course of illness, functional impairment or disability. Um, so these are the types of NCDs, uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, cancer, chronic respiratory disease, diabetes, chronic neurological disorders, arthritis, uh, muscular skeletal diseases, unintentional injuries, as well as uh, I think even mental illnesses uh, do have all these characteristics uh, shown to you before, and uh, they may also be considered as NCDs. Right, now let's look at the uh, fact that how stress causes NCDs. <clears throat> or how stress contribute uh, to uh, NCDs. Now, we all know, we learned this at medical school, the uh, stress uh, endocrine um, you know, hypothalamic axis and uh, the uh, complex uh, pathways here, which I'm not going to go into detail, but we know that uh, any uh, stress, which can be physical, which can be psychological, um, can affect our neuroendocrine system, our immune system, and create many uh, changes in our physiology as well as, you know, psychology. Um, just one little uh, focus here on uh, one of the uh, research findings uh, into this. There's a lot of research uh, going on here. This is uh, the paper is titled Psychologic Stress Reduced natural killer cell activity and cytokine dysregulation in women experiencing diagnostic breast biopsy. You know about uh, um, uh, natural killer cells, which are very important. Uh, they ingest uh, cancer cells. So that I'm, I'm reading the results. These results provide evidence that the experience of breast biopsy for cancer diagnosis leads to prolonged periods of stress, anxiety, and mood disturbance that appear to be associated with depressed natural killer cell activity and an altered pattern of cytokine production. Importantly, it appears that stress-induced alterations in the immune system are not transient but persist beyond the acute experience of breast biopsy. So lots of uh, scientific uh, findings which uh, uh, you know shed light on the connection between how uh, stress causing or contributing to Causation of uh, Now let's look at this editorial from Medical Science Monitor Basic Research. Um, uh, Frisian, one of the editors who is a Harvard uh, Medical School uh, academic, um, who uh, tries to highlight the fact that the research into the, the relationship between uh, stress and NCDs, how stress contributes to NCD, how stress causes NCD is not enough. We need more basic science research into this. And let me uh, show you some of the main uh, uh, pieces of uh, text from his, this editorial, which talks about childhood events resulting in the toxic stress contributing to NCDs, uh, epigenetics, neuroinflammation, inflammatory response syndrome, and stress-related mental illnesses, all of these having very clear connections with causation of NCDs. And um, uh, the last bit of his uh, editorial I would like to read, until we learn more about the causal links between the experience of chronic stress and subsequent metabolic wear and tear that takes its toll in brain and body and results in NCD vulnerability, we will have difficulty making progress. We hope that this new knowledge can then be translated, he's talking about the need of research and it could produce new knowledge, can then be translated into innovative primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention strategies, as well as improved management of NCDs. In the process, we may help advance our ability to nurture a healthier world. So it's not only about living longer, but living more healthily as well, having a better health, you know? having a better quality of your life in your life. Right. <clears throat> my uh, uh, latter part of my lecture here, yeah, I concentrate on how NCDs cause stress or how NCDs contribute to stress. 
let me uh, discuss these uh, interactions uh, or relationships with a couple of examples. So here, it's a man <coughs> who's 65, a wealthy businessman. He has long-term NCDs, many, and then he develops erectile dysfunction recently. And then he starts having issues in sex life. Um, he has a girl, he had a girlfriend, he has an affair, and you know, this uh, is not a girl who is uh, after him for his money. He's, he's a, you know, uh, she's a very good woman herself and uh, attractive and young and all that, and she, she leaves him. And, uh, you know, this is how NCDs affect our lives. It, they, they do affect our lives, you know. Um, so what happens next? His NCD control becomes poor. Um, and he starts taking cannabis, probably believing that cannabis will improve his sexual function, which is a myth. Um, and then what happens as quite, uh, uh, you know, evident, I mean, it's quite uh, implied that this is what's going to happen. His erectile function further deteriorates. And then he ends up in depression. His function level becomes poor. His decisions are not very good. And he, his business fails. So this is how NCDs uh, affect us, might, can, could, potentially affect us and um, create many issues and problems for us. So the lessons learned here, symptoms, signs, complications of NCDs do contribute to stress and how it does, we just had a look. And stress can contribute to the worsening of NCDs. In this case, um, you know, uh, he uh, started cannabis and that smoking and uh, it contributes to worsening of NCDs. Maybe his uh, control of NCDs, doing investigations and taking medications got worse. Maybe he stopped doing exercises. So stress can contribute to worsening of NCDs, and it's a vicious cycle. And remember, erroneous beliefs like um, cannabis will improve your sexual function, smoking will help uh, with your stress, alcohol will drown your problems. So all these erroneous beliefs uh, can contribute to worsening of stress as well as NCDs. So you can see the vicious cycle uh, happening here. Example two. <clears throat> so there's a man um, who's 55 years old. Uh, he has long-term NCDs and he develops chronic kidney disease. And now he's recommended to have dialysis. And you know how uh, tough uh, this whole treatment now becomes. He needs dialysis uh, three times a week and uh, the government, the public sector uh, would not be able to cope with that. If he's lucky, he might be offered one or two dialysis per week um, uh, from the public sector. Then he has to fund the remaining one or two and that's a lot of money and you have to spend an entire day at the hospital, uh, transport, um, so it's not going to be easy. The whole family's finances are going to be directed at, uh, you know, this whole, to this whole process. And that's going to cause lots of, uh, difficulties, lots of stress. <clears throat> so here we can, uh, see how the treatment of NCDs, in this case, uh, having to undergo dialysis, but dialysis are not just dialysis. It involves so many. Uh, other uh, expenses and uh, stressful um, uh, actions that you need to do. So this is an example of, example of how treatment of NCDs is uh, contributing to stress. <clears throat> um, my last example, so I hope I can save a considerable amount of time for questions. Um, my last example there is a woman, a 45-year-old domestic aide. She goes to a household with some family and does work there and earns some money. She has three kids and her husband is an alcohol user who doesn't give any money or gives little money uh, to the family who's not taking any responsibility. So he's the breadwinner, he's the mother and father for, for the kids and, you know, the kids must be young. So she's trying to raise them, she's trying to earn money and she has diabetes. And uh, now, she needs insulin 
So obviously she is going to need frequent clinic visits, investigations, and sometimes she might be asked to do some investigation in the private sector, insulin, and then the COVID, the medication might not come in time. She doesn't have money to purchase medication. She doesn't know how to purchase medication. So it's it's not easy. It's not easy. It's not just uh, you know uh, prescribing insulin and doing the fasting blood sugar and PPBS. It's much more complex than that. So now, <clears throat> as she gets one more stressed, she is more irritable. Uh, now she has less time to spend with kids, and kids become difficult to manage. Uh, father has no uh, offering, no help there, and now her glycemic control worsens. So this is what happens. We all know as physicians that when people people with NCDs when they become stressed in life, um, their uh, uh, glycemic control worsens, their blood pressure goes up. Um, we wonder how, and these are the ways that it happens. It's not just psychological stress. There are so many things happening um, in and around. And and then she stops being regulated in stages. She she is overwhelmed. She just can't cope with this anymore. She just stops being regular investigation. Um, and then she develops a wound that does not heal. And she can't, uh, she feels that there's no point and she tries an overdose of insulin. So this is how, you know, things uh, contribute uh, and make uh, worse, the factors make, contribute to each other and makes it worse and creates vicious cycle, cycles of complex uh, uh, dynamics, um, which is affecting um, the uh, overall health of the person. So uh, the lessons learned here, NCDs, psychosocial factors interact in a complex way. We need to understand that just prescribing the insulin or ordering the insulin is not enough. And um, it is not uh, rocket science to do this. That's my last message here. It's not uh, rocket science to do it. Okay, when we look at these and you know the evidence that we have found and the research that is needed, it might look like rocket science. Although you know these are uh, studies that can be done in Sri Lanka as well. However, these things, knowing that symptom signs uh, and complications of NCDs do contribute to stress, and um, stress contribute to worsening of NCDs. And uh, erroneous beliefs, like what I mentioned, the substance might help uh, contribute to worsening of stress and NCDs, and the treatment of NCDs contribute to uh, you know, all these things, and the NCD psychosocial factors interact in a complex way. These are, this is not rocket sense. We can, uh, these, these common sense. This is science. So this is what we need to comprehend, and this is what we need to base our actions on. Then we can upscale management of um, NCDs. We can upscale prevention. We can do it now. We can live longer like that and we can stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for that uh, valuable lecture. Uh, lecture. I would like to uh, ask a small question uh, regarding how the meditation affects uh, the stress levels and how it can uh, we can use the meditation to reduce the ncd levels okay uh, meditation uh, is uh, you know trying to calm your mind uh, <clears throat> mindfulness is uh, another form of meditation and um, these uh, you know uh, techniques would affect uh, help you to look at your life in a more deeper way and be conscious of what's happening to you. And it might help you to recognize that how your stress contributes to, you know, you stopping taking <clears throat> some medication or, or stopping doing investigations. And uh, that way it might help you to take some control over your life. Um, meditation having direct effect on uh, stress responses, on hypothalamus and the stress hormones have been demonstrated. So uh, just calming your mind down will obviously calm down your reticular formation of your autonomic nervous system, which is connected to all parts of the brain. <clears throat> that can help to 
uh, modulate your immune responses as well as even the kind responses and have less stress hormone. So obviously they would help. However, a word, word of caution, there are lots of, uh, you know, meditation classes, certificates and upgrade into different levels and you, know, you are given a particular certificate that you have achieved a certain level and this can <clears throat> create a new stress. Okay, my next door neighbor has achieved level two. I'm still at level one. Uh, how, I, how can I get to level two? And that is creating more stress. So be careful of that. If you are doing it for yourself uh, in, a, in a controlled way, in a, in a not overdoing it, be conscious of what you're doing. And yes, it can help. Thank you. Uh, I think we have a short time for any comments uh, to be made. Uh, if there are any participants who want to make a comment or a question, you can raise your hands, then we can allow you to unmute your microphone. Uh, however, make your comments or questions very brief. We can ask questions from all the three panelists. Uh, in the absence of questions, there are some coming from uh, the chat, maybe from Dr. Chaturanga. There are questions about sports drinks or protein supplements and uh, what about taking them during the exercise? What are your comments, Dr. Chaturanga? Yeah, it's a it's a widely uh, asked question from a lot of people. I was just uh, typing uh, one of the answers. So when it comes to supplements, uh, as it says, uh, uh, mostly asked question is about protein, whey protein that we use, and um, uh, protein should be a supplement, uh, and uh, provided that uh, your basic diet is fulfilled. If your basic diet is not fulfilled. Just getting a supplement will not be helpful. And mostly you take proteins as supplements. And the protein absorption is about 1 to 2 grams per kilogram body weight. That's about a person, maybe 6 to 100 would take maximum. If you are highly active, you are a highly strength training active, you will absorb more. So, uh, but most of the time with normal diet, we take it. Uh, but some people who can't take proteins, uh, can't take their animal proteins, sometimes there's a place for these proteins to be added on. The problem in Sri Lanka is most of the powders we see are not regulated and they are not registered. So what is inside these powders is not what you see maybe in the, uh, the, the packet. So that is one concern, but on principle, uh, whey protein or protein that we take with supplements to exercise is not wrong, it is done, but our concern is that regulation. But what we sometimes miss is sometimes Dr. Renuka also mentioned that we don't take enough carbohydrates uh, to supplement our exercise. We only try to take protein. So what happens is when you don't take enough carbohydrates, the proteins will also turn into an energy source, not as a building source. So we have to take ener energy adequately for your carbohydrates to act, uh, for your proteins to act. So the protein, uh, there's a pyramid, you have to first take the basic level, then the sports specific diet, and then only you go into the supplementation. And when it comes to sports drinks, sports drinks are mainly, there are a wide variety. Uh, they are mainly supplementing glucose and electrolytes. So these uh, drinks are available in the market. So isotonic drinks are good uh, to replenish. You get your, because if you do one hour of aerobic exercise, you might lose about one liter of uh, uh, sweat, right? You have to replace that. Uh, so to replace that, taking sports drinks is okay. So if you want to take glucose into sports drinks, if you're only going more than one hour, you have to replace glucose. So what in normally in our uh, public, what we do is we ask athletes to take Jeevani because Jeevani has electrolytes and glucose also, which is a very low uh, energy, a very low type of supplementation. You have expensive options also. So uh, sports drinks uh, can be divided. Just water is very important to hydrate yourself before exercise. Your urine color is a very good indicator. You should not be thirsty before you do exercise. If you are going more than one hour, you should replace the electrolytes, especially with Jeevani and with glucose. But less than that, 
uh, you depend on your loss of fluid, you have to replace the fluid. Yeah. Uh, can Dr. Mahesh comment on the psychological aspect about dietary habits? So you can link all the three topics together. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, now I can, I can see, see listening see to all the, the uh, speakers, speakers uh, that there's, there's, there's a lot of psychology, psychology behind, behind uh, uh, adopt, adopting those, those advices. advices. Now, for an example, um, and, and looking at the questions. So, for an example, if you have a belief that, you know, um, eggs are too dangerous, um, it will inc increase your cholesterol level, um, but, you know, and then, then junk food is bad, but now they have added salad into it and it is fresh and so may, it is not that bad. So there are lots of beliefs affecting our decisions, uh, just not knowledge. So you, we need to pay attention to how we, these beliefs are created in our minds. Who does it? Uh, advertising agencies, you know, rumors, some of these rumors are carefully uh, initiated, uh, you know, like uh, fresh milk is bad, then, you know, uh, powdered milk is better, um, a particular powdered milk is wonderful, uh, for an example, this DHA and all that, uh, the research shows that we have enough DHA in our uh, bodies already, you know, in our diet. Um, so lots of uh, erroneous beliefs uh, uh, regarding diet uh, are created and we are victims to that and that affects our decisions and our behavior. Even erroneous beliefs uh, regarding uh, exercise, as Jataranga highlighted, you know, exercise is not only for losing weight, uh, it's to maintain your fitness. So even if you, are, uh, if you didn't lose weight as much as you uh, expected to, your exercise still matters uh, because you need to keep yourself fit. So, I mean, sometimes we uh, laugh at people saying that you are still uh, obese or, or fat and, and you are doing exercise. That's, that's fine, keep doing the exercises. So these beliefs in our minds about the exercise, about the diet, about this and about that, I can look at the questions and find many of these uh, are, are beliefs uh, that have, are not entirely scientific or evidence informed. So pay attention to who creates these beliefs and who manipulates our behavior. Thank you.